Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. I just realized I was unmuted that whole time, so you heard me sniffing around the shop. <laughs> How's it going out there? Hey, Panda Boy. Hey, Cookie TM. Hey, DJ Marlis. Hey, Pascal Boy. Hey, Autumn Slaughter. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> Hopefully, I didn't say anything inappropriate. I think I was just mumbling to myself. I'm drinking the wonderful Hoplart tea with spruce tips out of uh, Boulder, Colorado here locally. It is a um, sparkling water with hops and spruce tips, which is amazing. It tastes like beer and pine trees, but it is not alcoholic, which is wonderful. Hey, Taco Dog. Hey, Rambling Geek. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Ebob boy, Ebob boy, Eb, Ebob, Ebob boy. Hey, Elgrand, El, oh, Elgrand. Howdy, howdy. Welcome, welcome. Yep, cheers, prost. Hey, Der Green. I realized I have secret projects sitting right in front of me. I have to be careful what I show off here. I still, I had planned on setting up an overhead camera for this stream and it hasn't happened yet. Um, but uh, it will soon, because uh, there are definitely things I want to show off. Unfortunately, right now, both sides of my workbench are covered with stuff that I'm not ready to show off yet, but I'm working on some very exciting iPhone stuff that is also very frustrating. Um, I thought it would be done a long time ago and there would be a video out and, um, hasn't happened yet. I have bought three new iPhones <laughs> recently <laughs> and a whole bunch of broken iPhones. So um, I have, not that it's that interesting, but I have broken iPhone shells here from, I think these are from eBay. And I'm not sure I'm really giving any hints, but Dirk Green, this is not the first stream since forever. We've done, this is the fourth show and tell stream um, that we've done. We've been doing them weekly uh, at the same time, same day. Um, Saturdays at noon Pacific. Um, so another broken, broken iPhone. Um, yeah, I'm doing well. Um, life is being good to me right now. Um, my health is is back in order and uh, not really slowing me down much anymore. I'm still working on staying healthy, um, but you know the more traditional stuff, losing some weight and uh, getting in shape and eating right and all that stuff. So yeah. Uh, did you, Marlos? I think this is the fourth because we did, we did, uh, we had, um, Sako and. Professor Tops, we had Sophie, and then the last one we did was like really chill, and it was like me and Ayush, and that might have been it. Maybe oh, we had the um, I don't remember who it was, but the the um, Game Boy Color mod, and uh, yeah, so I think this is our fourth, um, which is awesome. It means we've been doing this for a month, which is fantastic. It's working really well, and I'm. Glad to have all of you here. Uh, yeah. Rambling Geek, it would be great to have you do a show and tell um, next week. Um, so yeah, I uh, hope to see that. I hope to see that. Um, we do have a couple things lined up. I know we've got uh, we've got Patrick OD with something exciting to show off. And um, uh, Scave Rat. Um, is going to help someone else that he's hanging out with show off something cool um, that I'm particularly excited to see. So uh, we got that going on. I'll give a little teaser here. And if you guys, if you have questions, feel free to kind of do a Q, a, a uh, impromptu Q&A often in the beginning of these. So if, uh, while people are trickling in and stuff. So fire away if you've got questions. Um, I thought I would show off something cool by a friend of mine. Um, that they're making custom. So everybody's familiar with alligator clips, right? Um, I don't use them a ton, but when I do, they're awesome, um, super useful. But they always come in like primary colors. 
Well, Lee Cyborg has made these amazing pastel custom uh, alligator clips. And uh, I thought I would show those off. I thought that was a pretty cool, it's sort of like a manufacturing hack, right? Um, this is something my friend Ian Lesnat of Dangerous Prototypes, um, he was the first one to show, to show me. If you can find a product that already exists and make a small tweak on it to make it more exciting, um, you could often manufacture it for very little money, right? Like this just involves finding a manufacturer that, and I haven't talked to Lee directly about this, but I'm guessing this involved going and finding a manufacturer who makes primary color uh, alligator clips and saying, hey, would you make some in different colors for me? I'll pay you a little extra, um, you know, and I'll order X many. So um, I did want to throw up a, a link. If you'd like some of them, um, you can get them here. that up on the screen. Um, actually, I think, yeah, I don't know if the page ID is required, but um, yeah, if you if you go to the root of the domain, you can click on shop. shop. Um, oh, and there's a big picture of it. So if you don't want to type the whole thing. Um, yeah. So that's a fun thing. They've also got some cool other um, little doohickeys and zines and things on there. So you can go check that out. Um, yeah, but I just thought, I don't know. I love stuff like this. I love custom things that's kind of, you know, challenging the status quo a little bit, you know, being like, we don't have to be all stuffy about our electronics. We can, we can make cool electronic stuff. So anyway, go check that out. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. Red and green gets boring. Exactly. Yeah. Mr. Charles has it. Yep. Um, if you're not getting stream notifications, uh, sign up for uh, or join our Discord, and um, make sure you turn on the Discord, uh, the Twitch notifications. Um, this is the sign up link here, um, and uh, yeah, we all hang out there. You can talk about all of the projects you're going to see today. Everybody who's presenting hangs out on Discord, and uh, there's tons of other projects constantly being shared on Discord as well as. People are helping each other with advice and where to find things and all that good stuff. So, um, and I send out notifications every time there's a new video and every time there's a live stream. So, go check that out. Uh, yeah. What else we got here? Um, yeah, the breaking news style banner. Um, is courtesy of Restream, um, which we're, we're starting to use as a platform, at least for these show and tells, uh, because it makes it easy for us to add additional people into the, the stream. Uh, so you can join us uh, on the stream today if you'd like to. Um, you just need to go to uh, this link here and uh, fill out a quick form so we know what you want to present. And um, the mods will, uh, will help you get uh, all set up and on the stream. You can show your face if you want, we can have a chat, or um, you can not show your face and just show your thing and we can have a chat, or you can just um, put, upload some photos or a video to the uh, the the, uh, the form and uh, and I'll talk about it, react to it, and we can uh, talk back and forth in the chat. So however you'd like to do it, uh, no pressure. Yeah, these the bottom thirds and the, and the tickers are, are really great and it's just one click for me to highlight a comment. I can find a comment in the in the list of comments and the, the mods can actually um, star comments so that I can see that there's something um, they think is worth highlighting. So that's awesome. Particularly when we get a lot of people in here, it's uh, it's really worth it. So yeah, it's working out great for us. We're still a little rough around the edges. We're trying to figure out um, how to do some notifications and stuff on stream. So um, yeah, but we're gradually figuring it out. Um, <clears throat> awesome. Let's see what else. Uh, looks like Patrick's getting warmed up here. I do have some other things to show off. This is something I don't think I've showed this off before. So, so well, this is a broken bulb from these bulbs right here, which are about this big around. They're 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 pretty sizable. They're like almost basketball size. Um, and these are just GE bulbs. Um, they're like I don't know. They're about thirty bucks a piece. But they're actually, and this one just got dropped. Um, it's very sharp, so I'm having to be careful. But they're LED. And um, this is flexible LED filament. And 
if you look really closely, this might not show up on camera, but let's see if I can get to focus on it. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to show it off, but it looks to me like this is silicone over molded around a string of little surface mount LEDs. So I have this set aside because at some point I want to hook this up to a power supply and um, see what it's all about. Take it apart and uh, see if we can use this LED filament for other things. Uh, they look super nice. They're dimmable. Um, I love them. Um, it's not EL cable. Um, it's It definitely has small little tiny LEDs in it. Um, EL cable, EL wire usually just kind of looks uniform. So yeah. Uh, Dirk Green, I am using, um, I'm using OBS, but only barely. So uh, for some reason, Restream, the web interface, we're using the web interface on Restream. Um, so that's doing most of the heavy lifting. Uh, and I'm just using OBS with a virtual camera, just because Restream doesn't like to talk to my camera. I've got a, a Blackmagic capture card that is not super compatible with lots of things. So um, OBS is sort of the <laughs> compatibility layer. Uh, we're trying to keep things pretty lightweight um, uh, for the show and tells, um, uh, just so that there's not a lot of setup. And when I'm traveling, we can still do them and stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. What else we got going on here? Uh, I see people are still tricking it, trickling in. I have a fun little, um, as I continue to work, well, this is a fun little camera thing. Uh, so as I continue to work in the shop here, I'm figuring out what's most productive for me. And, um, you know, it's, it's really like been a progression of me shooting more and more in the workshop, um, at least for my build videos. And so figuring out how to do that efficiently, how to light it. I've got two lights here, um, on either side of me. Let's see, let's zoom out a little bit. You can always see the corner. You can see the corners of each. Um, I've got a big, uh, light dome here, and then I've got um, a little LED panel here, a smaller LED panel here with a diffuser on it. And so one of the things that, um, sorry, let me zoom this in. Um, one of the things that I'm learning is that I need lots of mount points. Uh, and actually Patrick uh, came here and hung out for a week and we installed um, this lighting grid up here, which is uh, like two inch diameter pipe that goes all the way around the perimeter. And then I've got one piece that goes across the room that this light is hanging on. And uh, and then all of the shelving and stuff is uh, three quarter inch pipe. And so what that leads to is I can clamp things anywhere I want, but I'm finding that, that even that's not flexible enough. And so I've been accumulating more and more of these magic arms, which I think I might've showed off once before on a stream a long time ago. Um, I got a different style of them this time. They were a little bit cheaper. I've been trying to pick them up used or or on discounts wherever I can, because I now have four of these. I ordered two more, and then I have um, two of a different style. But the idea is that they're, they've are they got basically three joints. They've got um, just a rotational joint in the middle, and then they've got ball joints on the ends. And these are all standard fittings for um, film and, and uh, video gear. So this is a standard receptacle that things can clamp onto. You can screw things in here. This is uh, probably a quarter 20. And then there's a larger, I don't know what it is, five eighths maybe here. Um, it's a, But they're standard threading for film gear. And then, yeah, you can clamp um, various things on the ends here. And so like, for instance, one of these is holding up the camera that I'm looking into. Um, yeah, and it has some other things that has a ball head on it and some stuff. Um, and then that light, uh, over here is hanging off one and uh, um, just clamped on the, the railing I've got behind the computer. Um, but so, th so the cool thing about these is that they are totally flexible. It's a little stiff just because I don't have enough leverage, but um, the idea is that you can move any of the joints until you flip this handle and now that it's all locked. Uh, and so the idea is you loosen the handle, position the light or camera wherever you want it, and then, and then lock it in place. And so these are called magic arms. Um, these are Manfrotto magic arms. Manfrotto seems to make the longest ones um, and the like most robust ones, but unfortunately they're they're a little bit pricey. This, this was a hundred bucks and the, it was a bit of a, uh, a deal. So um, it's <laughs> what I'm learning is like the, the grip gear um, 
the, you know, mounting gear for film and TV, it, it gets expensive fast. I probably have probably a couple grand of it at, at this point. I have like five C stands, which uh, are about 200 bucks a piece. And then all these little bits and pieces, but um, the, the options are, are many. Um, and so what I'm finding is that I actually, I thought, oh, I just need as many as I need like lights or cameras. But what I'm learning is that it's actually useful to have some like set positions along the workbench um, for various setups. And so be able to sort of move cameras from setup to setup. So um, like this streaming setup, it's nice to just have that in place and be able to put a camera on it and go. Um, uh, this is another style here, which I really like. It's simpler. It's obviously more flimsy, but I can put smaller lights on this um, and they're much cheaper. I think they're like 30 or 40 bucks. I might even get cheaper than that uh, used. And they sort of have, um, they have knobs at every position, right? So this rotates and then this spins, right? And then this is this is like an adapter I put on here to be able to screw into a light that has a quarter 20 mount point. And then this would go into the clamp, right? And the clamp has a receptacle for that. And then the middle, this is kind of clever. They actually just made it so that these can slide in addition to rotate. And so you really can kind of configure this however you want. It's for, for some things, it's less flexible than the magic arm because you can't kind of loosen everything and move it around at once. And in other ways, it's actually more useful because you can lock various dimensions off and just say, okay, I want to just change the tilt here or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's been really useful. Um, and I'm, I, you know, despite it being sort of expensive, um, it's not even sort of expensive, it's expensive. Uh, it, it really seems like a good investment. The more I more I invest, the, the faster I'm able to shoot and move and stuff. So, um, and then you sort of get into like other things. So like, here's, you know, a, uh, I think I forget what they call this, but here's a clamp. You can either clamp it on pipe or on like the edge of a desk. And then these are actually separate pieces, right? So that's the clamp again, standard receptacle. And then you've got this, which is called a gobo head and it can clamp onto any of these standard things. And then you can put all sorts of things in this end. So you could put everything from like a sheet of foam core um, to either act like as a light bounce or as a like a flag to prevent light you know, to block light off. You know whether it's like white or black. Um, uh, so you can put that in there and clamp it. I put fabric in here and clamped it to create like a backdrop here. Um, but you also in these holes can stick these standard sizes, right? So this arm can go in here. Um, and now I've got this setup that, you know, I can clamp on a pipe or a wall or, you know, whatever. And, uh, and it's totally adjustable in all these different ways. Right. And so I can, you know, have this, like I could have this over a desk where I could clamp it onto the desk and I have a light shining down on the desk. Right. And so the idea is that using this, you can move incredibly quickly because it's kind of this erector set that you can just throw together. So, um, yeah, that's, I just got those in yesterday, which is, I just brought them out to the shop. So they're kind of sitting in a pile, uh, to integrate here. looks like we have some folks that are maybe ready to join, uh, the stream to show things off. Um, but I'm not quite sure who's ready. So if a, um, Mod can give me a thumbs up on Patrick. You look super low frame rate, so that might be something that needs to be solved. Um, let's see. Let me read through chat here. Uh, so with the restream setup, could I go mobile in the shop with a phone? Yeah, totally, totally. Because you can basically like essentially dial in to the um restream setup um just with a, a phone and a web browser so yes absolutely we can wander around the shop um we'll have to figure out what's going on downstairs to see if that's an option today but it's it's potential um yeah and don't even have to involve obs in the in the mix um dirt green said um big clive made a video a lot of videos about these this LED filament and it's, yeah, it's LEDs in silicone rubber. Yeah, awesome. Um, 
but yes, as, as DJ Marlis pointed out, like, because I've got lots of, I've got three secret projects in various parts of the shop. I've got one over here. I, they're just everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. So why well, we'd have to be careful. Um, not quite ready to show some stuff off yet. Um, I do have my microscope from New Mexico. It's sitting right down here and, um, yeah, still working great. So, um, Definitely uh, getting a lot of use out of it. I'm finding the weird thing about microscopes is at least with dissection microscopes, the way you focus them is by physically moving the whole head of the microscope up and down, which moves the eyepieces up and down. And so you need an adjustable chair so that you can adjust down as you focus downward. Um, and it's especially pronounced when I change the magnification. I have a, it's called a Barlow reducer on the microscope. Let me grab one. Uh, so this is a Barlow reducer. It's just a single, you know, essentially magnifying glass that screws on the, on the bottom. It's a single objective that screws on the bottom of the scope. This one is a 2X, um, but I have a 0.5X on there right now. And it literally just changes the magnification by 2x or you know whatever it says on it. Uh, and the reason I use a, a 0.5x most of the time is because at the same time it increases the magnification or decreases the magnification in this case, uh, it also changes the working height. So um, this one now doubles the working height. The microscope can be twice as tall, which is great, except that I tore a cable, I tore a flex cable working on an iPhone the other day and uh, it's a hard one to replace. And uh, so I had to do some surgery to repair it, which was painful. And I wanted to get really up close to see the cable. And uh, so I took the Barlow off. Well, that reduces the working height in half. So it's it's a, quite a few inches, you know, it's three or four inches reduction. And uh, which means my chair has to go much lower. And uh, my chair doesn't go low enough for the desk that I have for the microscope I have. So. Um, you know, first world problems, but I've, I've started to get a crick in my neck from bending over. So I might have to figure something out, either either a platform to put the work on, to put it a little bit higher so that I can work higher, but then you sort of start raising your arms up. So I, I don't know, it's gonna be an interesting uh, um, thing. Um, uh, yeah, I've got, we've got mods talking to me here. Uh, DJ Marlis, yeah, I'm ready to do, um, Whatever you've got ready, if if you guys have um, Scave Rat and uh, Thebis ready, um, let me know and we can do that. Um, just just let me know that when you're ready to go. A sit stand desk would totally help with the microscope, and I have one in the house that I use for like writing work and stuff. Um, when I don't want to be or surrounded by a bunch of shiny objects that distract me, uh, including computers. Um, but uh, I don't have one out here. I thought about getting one for the computer setup, but getting one for the microscope setup wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, I just would want it to be fairly steady. And yeah, I, I don't think microscope manufacturers, at least the budget microscope manufacturers, spend much time thinking about ergonomics. I think, you know, there hasn't been a ton of innovation, at least at the low end, um, in quite a while. So that, or I just don't know what I'm doing, which is totally possible. Uh, Raise my chair again, feel like I'm low. <laughs> All right, uh, it sounds like we've got uh, Scave Rat and Thebis ready to go. So let's uh, let's bring them on the stream here. Um, let's see, get some things reconfigured. All right. Okay. Welcome. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. This Very looks exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite a it's quite a beast. Uh, it's great honor to be online uh, in the stream after quite a long time. Uh, so well, we are thank in, you for uh, yeah, thank you for being willing to show this off. This is awesome. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. Uh, so we are currently in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have a little tech hacker meetup, you could say. And uh, because I had this idea that maybe it will be a bit boring, you know, with a lot of talks and learning. So I figured we could spice it up a little bit. 
and uh, it just so happened that I found this uh, vintage uh, gambling machine in a flat that I have been um, moving out recently and the original owner kind of abandoned it uh, like 30 years ago so uh this was one of the most interesting things found there uh, however this is it was incredible <laughs> Yeah, and it, it even uh, played a sound uh, to catch our attention. It does that sometimes, uh, yep. but it was in a, a really... mode is what they call it on on Vegas yeah, Rock, yeah. at least. Yeah. Uh, precisely, precisely. So this is like an ancestor machine. Uh, this one uh, has been uh, made in West Germany in 1980, and it's one of the uh, first of the machines that were not purely mechanical. It actually has okay. a computer inside, and we will take a look at it. Uh, yeah. But maybe, maybe, maybe let's uh, let's uh, take a look around the machine so you can appreciate how big it actually is. It weighs yeah. about forty kilograms, and <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty heavy. I can't carry it uh, as a single person. Somebody always has to has to help me, and uh, you will be able to. Go glance inside but we will we will uh if we have time we'll uh, take a look more thoroughly uh yeah. but i would like to return here to the front if we can uh because you can really appreciate uh the uh, the design of the machine it's uh, i've been i spent like 10 days cleaning it mostly and uh what i can tell you is uh, the people spent quite a lot of time before this uh product has seen the light of the bars and uh, uh playrooms where it was intended to yeah. to work uh, there is even original serial number uh, displayed here so uh it's it's like uh, it's it's very it's kind of original condition it's very well uh it's not it has not been well kept but it's well preserved so yeah. Uh, most of the parts should be working, but my intention is not uh, original historic restoration. I was thinking about some new life for this thingy. So uh, we have managed, uh, thanks to thanks to quite a few of uh, my friends that have gathered here uh, the, with their expertise, we have managed to actually get this working, playing, blinking, and repair it into the condition that you will be able to see it in today. So. Uh, that's awesome. Maybe maybe uh, let's see what's inside because that's uh, yeah. another exciting part and so, it's very technological. So I will before we do that, a bit explain more. to us just how the game would work because this looks so different from like a slot machine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the typical slot machines, uh, as you probably. Yeah, this is a German style, and oh, the typical okay. slot machines you are probably used to have vertical plates vertical yep. uh, vertical motion yeah. but this device yeah. is a bit different uh, some people actually said that this was like a hidden slot machine that the gambling was not meant to be apparent mm. uh, at the first view so uh, this is how it works there are three plates that uh, will spin when the game is active and it tries to create the impression that you can stop it by observation or your skill and actually win sure. something but uh, obviously this is a gambling machine so the odds of winning are not that good and not that much in your favor but being yeah. the operator of this machine and having it in your restaurant or bar i imagine that back in the days it was quite profitable <laughs> yep. and so the 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 various boxes that are boxed in yellow blue and white those are kind of the the wind lines for the uh, you know, actually like you could see on a vertical style machine three three of the mesh uh, yeah, so so you have to match the three uh, of the same number in order to like uh, get on the winning side of things, and ah, then you have yeah. some bonuses. Like uh, if you manage to get crown, I think you get some free games, uh, as far as I understand it. I haven't Got been it. really playing it uh, that much, so uh, yeah, I will sure. probably be able to uh, tell you a bit more about the insights and the mechanics. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's see those. Yeah. Actually, actually, I we managed to get it have working. The context of like what, you know, what was the yeah. store and how kind of how yeah, it was this, used. Yeah, th actually, actually, you can take the the point of view that this machine used to be quite evil because uh, it stripped a lot of uh, people of, uh, sure. from a lot of money. So uh, yeah. I am also not ignoring this context, and I would like a different life for, for sure. this machine, like uh, you know, a vintage thing that maybe hangs somewhere on a wall and reminds us of the past that maybe was. Uh, 
precise in manufacturing, but not that caring about laws and sure. uh, social aspects. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Uh, so. Now we have seen the front side of this crown machine. Uh, maybe let's open it a bit more and take a look inside, shall we? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so I'll just carefully open it a bit more than it is now. And as you can see, uh, this machine uh, has been quite well designed uh, for uh, service, uh, for service, yeah. for manufact, uh, for ease of manufacturing, and uh, there is even a socket. It's one of the most uh, visible parts when you open the machine. There is a regular yeah. power socket, which uh, was used uh, by the serviceman, or you could uh, plug in some attachment or add-on, as we would say today. And yep. uh, it's it's quite bizarre. So the um, uh, in the in the back of the box, it's one of the biggest parts. Is this uh, is this power supply? It's this this area. Yeah. It was also not in the greatest condition. One of the fuses terminals is a bit damaged, so we had to use some tape to keep it in a working condition. And uh, when I was starting fiddling with it, one of the fuses kept blowing constantly, so that was yeah. an issue we had to fix. But we have managed so. Uh, then. Uh, on these uh, on the sides there would be uh, there would be places where the coins uh, got inside the machine and uh, uh -huh. uh, I, have it, I have it right here so this is one of the mechanical parts of the machine uh, this is the way it's like one kilogram. It's it's really heavy and it's quite precious machinery because it was able to detect uh, precisely what coin was inserted into the machine. The input sure. of this mechanical device is this top thingy. <laughs> and um, uh, when you needed to just release the coin, you were, you were able to do it with a lever on the side of the machine. So, so that was done like this. Yeah. And uh, w when the coin came through, it fell out of, of these holes uh, in the bottom, and then it got sorted accordingly. So there was a giant uh, yeah. mm, box uh, for uh, for the uh, for the guy who was um, um, who owned the machine, and then uh, some of the coins actually got into such tubes, like uh, we can see here, and those would then be. Uh, maybe sometime paid out later using these uh, magnetic release mechanisms. So uh, yeah, the, 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 it, there is still quite heavy mechanical part in this. And uh, that's not something I'm keen on also because these coin machines are uh, basically preset to uh, West German marks. And uh, there is not really many coins of the type nowadays in Czech Republic. So uh, I'm yep. not uh, going to be able to use this. But I was thinking that maybe I will be able to replace it with some kind of Chinese uh, acceptor uh, if I need any coin mechanism, which I probably want. Yes. But anyways. Yes. Uh, I think you totally so... can. I, I have some, some fairly extensive experience with this, at least with... Uh with sort of Vegas style machines. And yeah, there are uh -huh. a bunch of different coin acceptors and coin hoppers and things that you can retrofit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was and studying very, that. Very and they're very, very simple. Yeah, very simple. <laughs> yes. You know, they're mechanically uh, so, so complicated. That's... Electrically, very easy to sort of slot into an existing machine. You know? It's yeah, just, yeah, precisely. You, know, you, you flip a, you know, it sends a pulse or it, you know. It yes. A, a line high, you know. It's, it's not, <laughs> not a total. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't really think uh, that I would like uh, this machine to be um, keen on money. <laughs> if you guess me, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I will. I, I will probably. I will probably use the space uh, that's uh, that uh, remains after the coin acceptors. I may be able to uh, use that space as a mini bar or something. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, that sounds amazing. okay. Uh, so that was the back side of the machine. And now let's uh, take a look at the more interesting front side. Uh, let me try to open it a bit more even. And here we can see the uh, part that's no longer uh, uh, that's no longer handled mechanically. This is a vintage computer. It's uh, based on a Zilog uh, Z80 CPU, I think. But actually, uh, this one is the CPU. 
but uh, it also has another integrated circus such as this one. And this is actually a periphery of the of the CPU itself. So uh, uh, it's 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 a design you, you probably won't see nowadays. And actually, the yeah. traces have probably been like hand designed because yeah, when you take a look at the drawn. detail, yeah, it it seems like that so it's 43 yeah. years old machine and uh, you can see that uh, it's quite different from what you would see nowadays but i would like to pinpoint that it's very mm, like it's it has a sense of german precision you know because the yep. the, the cables <laughs> are labeled and yeah precisely so so thanks to this uh, probably we were able to make it work Yep. Uh, to uh, to make it work in the are, in the are current those spots, uh, those silvery spots along the the traces, particularly right above the CPU, are those vias? Uh, yes, uh, it's it's like uh, I think it's double sided uh, board. Okay. So yep. there are true holes. Yes, and yep. actually this this damage uh, this board has been quite quite damaged. And uh, that's that's the part that's uh, being in in detail now. There was a battery, you know, to hold statistics and uh, some data for yeah. tax office and likes. And you know where this is going. Uh, the machine has stood thirty years and collected dust, and the battery leaked and uh, quite heavily damaged an integrated uh, inverter circuit that was right next to it. So that had to yeah. be cleaned and resoldered, and a yeah. uh, few bases around it as well. So uh, without my friends i wouldn't be able to fix it at all because um because that was that was quite something uh, yeah. so that's that's a good idea to bring it on some kind of event you know to spice things up and maybe uh, to yeah. give uh, other people a challenge as well uh, totally. so I'm, I'm 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 excited that everything has worked out this weekend like this and um, there was also you know what the red uh, daughter board is in the upper upper left corner uh, you mean you mean these you mean these three? Uh, yeah. Uh, the the three yeah, uh, the three oh, yeah the three chips with the dots. Uh, that's oh, uh, no, no, pretty no, sorry, valuable. One... Yeah, go ahead. But I was asking about something uh, else. That, go that ahead. Was, uh, the, the, the the three chips are pretty valuable because they hold uh, actual information. They are memory chips. They are yep. programmable memories or something. So if these would be damaged, uh, the machine is dead. But thankfully, yeah. they have uh, survived uh, the corrosion and everything. And uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe the board on the leftmost part, uh, that probably was some kind of add-on or a patch or something like that. Yeah. If there is an error. Yeah, it's, it's some kind of made uh, made after reset logic. Like uh, probably huh. was not in the original plan, but it got there nonetheless. I, I don't know if it was original, but probably yes, because yeah. there is a number uh, corresponding to the machine. Uh, so we had to dismount this, uh, this uh, board quite a few times and uh, use oscilloscopes and multimeters to measure it and uh, yeah. find the broken components and uh, repair it. So we will see for how long it lasts. Um, and this is this is the computer. And one one more aspect that has helped us greatly to fix this machine is that when I was moving it for the first time, thinking, hmm, the lock is still engaged. Maybe there are even money inside. Ah, another attention-seeking moment. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. I love it. Um, um, just so just we, really quick, uh, chat is saying here, uh, Mr. Charles in chat is saying, that those three chips look like UV erasable EEPROM chips and that the red dots are probably stickers to keep the erase window covered. Yes, that's very likely the case. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the other aspect that has helped us greatly to repair it is this uh, oh. little uh, red uh, manual. You can see the original logo of the company, TH Bergmann and oh. Company Automatenbau. I can't think of more German word than Automatenbau. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's the peak of Germanness. Auto Automatenbau mean? Yeah, it means, uh, I, I think it means company making like machines. Okay. <laughs> so, something like that. So yep. we were carrying this this uh, heavy beast uh, for the first time from the from the flat, and it actually opened on us, and this red book uh, fell out. 
It has some uh, handwritten notes on it, so it has history. And this is another uh, another example of German precision because after 43 years, this little book uh, helped us to get it uh, get it repaired because it contains very important information. The first part is about uh, operating the machine, and uh, it's yeah. all in German. And I don't actually uh, speak or read German that much, so my friends had to assist me, and I was also using a translator for this, and it was kind of working, um, yeah. so we have some information about it. But the uh, interesting, uh, the, the further you are in the book, the more interesting it gets. And uh, there are a few things I would like to show to you because uh, they helped us a great deal. Yeah, there are some, uh, this is a list of error codes. Some are written by hand. <laughs> awesome. They're like, Put up, you know, after after some experienced operator um, had uh, had some issues, so he was so kind sure. to fill it in. And uh, then when we continue, we have this list. This is very interesting because this describes some kind of self-diagnosis mode, which is uh -huh. uh, selected by one of the one of the selectors in the machine by this. Uh, a uh, little green uh, switch you can change about nine modes the machine can operate yeah. in and the switch is kind of falling apart so hopefully we won't have to use it nowadays but if you put it in the self-diagnosis mode there are like 37 uh, test uh, events that you can observe and pinpoint where the machine perhaps may be defective so I think this is quite a good quality Asheran's uh, approach, and yeah. I quite appreciate it. So this helped us this a great deal. And now... The machine that yeah. I did a bunch of work on had something very similar to this. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I think then, the machine was pretty expensive back in the day. So yes. it probably yeah, makes I'm sense. Sure it was. Yeah, sure. And now, now we get to the last part, which is actually diagrams. So we can see how the um, how the parts of the machine are actually made, manufactured, and what to uh, look at uh, when you are trying to uh, repair it or diagnose. So we have something related to um, uh, to money and display. Then we yeah. have uh, uh, then we have something. Uh, uh, something about the winning. Uh, here we have the power supply diagram. This was super important yep. for me because, uh, for example, it shows the fuses that are supposed to be used. And the further we go, these are connectors, I think. And the last two pages are just just marvelous because um, this is like some kind of assembly assembly plan. You can yeah, easily board layout. I, yeah, yeah, identify describe what's where so this has helped uh, yeah. me in particular because i speak german uh, this was yeah. very good and uh, integrated the part that was damaged you can see here this this big part that used to be a four volt battery or something and this yeah. ic number nine was an inverter for the tact generator and this was completely broken so it had to be replaced so that happened and now the machine is in front of us in the last page that's a real game because that's the diagram of the main board computer we have uh, I've examined uh, a while ago. Gorgeous. Yeah, this is this is just these it drawings has... are just lovely. I mean, you don't see yeah. like this anymore. They're this real. Yeah, they are definitely not being packaged uh, to modern computers of any kind. That's for sure. Uh, um, so well, and yeah, just uh, when you do get a schematic, they're not this clear. You know, this is yeah, I, I, I'm actually more of a software guy in a daily life, yeah. so I maybe can't appreciate it, but. I, I get aura, I get a feeling. So, and it has helped me helped me with some steps to uh, to actually repair it together with my friends. So, uh, this has been a great help to us, and without it, we may not even be able to uh, to get it into the state it is in now. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, Amazing. I think we have mostly mostly seen what's inside, but there is uh, there is kind of probably like two things I'd like to show. And this is the, uh, this is the lumps slash uh, vining mechanism because you have these rotating disks that have holes in them. 
There is yeah. a regular light bulb in front uh, with our point of view, and there are photo uh, photo uh, detectors on the other side. And when the machine stops, uh, it uses this light coming through the holes to actually uh, be able to calculate or uh, identify if you have won or not. So this is sure. like the main mechanical component mm -hmm. of the gambling game that's well, and it helps uh, you. Point of this machine. I mean, it helps the machine figure out where the dials are rotated in general. Um, yeah, precisely. Which is precisely. A problem because you, you know, if the if the user is relying on what they say on them, uh, you really have to know where they are. <laughs> yes. And it was the yes. exact same thing on the vertical reels on the machine I worked on. Same same exact setup. Um, it, and it it, it would it, actually go through a calibration routine to make sure that it knew where the reels were when it started up every time. Um, actually, awesome. this uh, also is one of one of the errors that this this that this machine can produce is related to the discs not being uh, clearly readable or not being in a correct position. Yeah. So it has some kind of something that we would today call like uh, anti tampering mechanism or something. It is it yeah. is there, but it's it's not that if you, if you manage to open it. You own it, so that was yeah, that. Right. And now I think it's time to, yeah. So I think now it's probably time to take a look how it spins. Yeah. And uh, Love this we've actually we've actually managed a hack. So now the light uh, green lights are shining, so we should be able to input money. But I have no German um, marks, so we yep. have hacked one of the uh, coin acceptors input. So we should be able to th to make the machine think that we have actually input a five mark coin by pressing this button, the return button, and then okay. things will happen. So let's do it. It may get quite noisy, so okay. I won't put more money there. Oh, and <laughs> okay. So this what happened. Now we got now we got the tampering mechanism engaged. Ah, uh, uh, yep. And, uh, I will have to have reset the open? machine. I, no, no, no. It's it's not because of the doors. It's because uh, I have probably pressed the button for too long or uh, oh, accidentally yeah. twice. So now I now yeah. I have to yeah. And now I have to set the mode three on the uh, falling apart rotary dial to uh, uh, reset the machine. Now the button is enough. So now I will press the button. It will reset. It will beep. It will restart. Okay, that seems okay. Very nice. Now I will go back to mode zero, which is regular gaming mode, and perform another restart. I love the <laughs> keyboard keycap there. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's, that's yeah, exactly. 1980s, man. <laughs> and now I have to be careful and maybe a bit faster about pushing the button. So let's try it once yep. more. Yes. And we have five, oh, five nice. marks in the machine. And we have already lost 30 Fenix for the first game. <laughs> so, uh-huh. And stop. Yeah, 120, 120, 240, probably losing. OK, so let's go further. OK, another game. And, uh, and so the reels are 40, in theory 40. stopping when you push the button, but uh, probably not totally accurately. You can, you can stop it and uh, start it at moments. You can even like return it to movement at some yep. specific points. Oh, okay. I think I have won something. Chance to double it. Ah, oh. okay. Now I have six nice. mark fifty, and we are <laughs> we are we are continuing the game. <laughs> ah, okay. This was not that good. So are these? Start machines, another one. Can you still find these machines uh, to play in Germany, like this, uh, or is this kind of an anachronism at this point? I think that at this point. They still, they still exist. There are, there are a few people who are like uh, collecting them uh, from, what yeah. I, from what I have managed to Google. But otherwise, they have been replaced by uh, Crown Gold. Then there was a Crown Jewel. Then there was a Crown Jewel Deluxe. Then there was Crown Jewel Premium HD. And it goes like this. Uh, so the modern machines 
are not that recognizable and yeah. um, the law have, have the also changed spinning disks well i don't think so okay but apparently people say they are so it's possible so there are other machines uh, i think the this company also maybe made a roulette that's still quite popular in oh okay. nope <laughs> okay whatever but we still have uh, five marks so we are still nice okay your five marks are going a long way here yeah i haven't i haven't lost that much so far but uh, I probably won't be able to. Well, you know, it's just it's just a demo. <laughs> I can't get uh, too carried away by this. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so yeah, this is this is the machine, and uh, I'm still thinking about what I will do with it, like uh, going further, because yeah. uh, this is no more, in my point of view, this is no more a gambling machine. This is some funny vintage thing that I'm playing with. And I was actually thinking about uh, playing with various technologies available at this at this event, and I was thinking maybe I can make it talk, you know, connect it to Chat GPT and yep. uh, pre 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 process prompts, and then uh, turn them into audio. So maybe if you, if you come close to the machine, it will invite you to play or something. So uh, the the future for this particular machine is still uh, still in the question. I think it's a, a great opportunity to make a dystopian gambling machine that never does quite what you want and never actually yeah. takes your money. It just sort of just sort of tortures you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly a possibility. Uh, I mean, the machine kind of does it with the kind of faulty-ish board computer. Uh, we had a, <laughs> we, we we spent like a day. Like it was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 hours before we got it into this state where it's uh, willing to accept uh, 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 fake money and give us a spin. So uh, I don't really know where this machine, uh, what this machine will be looking like after another 12 hours of work. But yep. uh, that's that's maybe something for for another for another day. Well, this uh, is a great starting point for something awesome. I can I can tell there's there's something awesome that will this will turn into. Um, but yeah, God, what a piece of history! <laughs> totally, totally. I, I yeah, still feel I mean, kind of like respect, and it, it has this aura, so I really don't want to break it, and I don't want to move too hard and uh, too fast and too hard to break yeah. things. But I'm still trying to find some kind of like a middle way to uh, yeah. bring it into the into the future, and yet uh, keep its original soul. So this is my yeah. crown uh, vintage gambling machine, and. Um, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, are you That's familiar with the project I did with a with a slot machine modifying a slot? Machine? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm unfortunately not. Uh, actually, I've uh, well, learned. I, I, no worries. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, but the but just uh, as a point of reference, I um, did a couple of videos uh, merging a slot machine, um, an old you know three reel style slot machine, uh, huh. Vegas style with an ATM, so that. Because I have the same feeling as you, which is slot machines just steal from people. So I built a slot uh -huh. machine that you always win the jackpot on every single time. <laughs> but but you're winning your own money because you put in uh -huh. your debit card, your bank card, and select how much you'd like to win wow. on the ATM interface. And then when you pull the handle, the spin, we, I, I basically took all of the boards. It, it was of the same era as this machine, had similar circuit boards, maybe like one or two generations past this. And I gutted it and replaced it by a by an Arduino, and so I could uh -huh. uh, so I could guarantee that it would hit jackpot. Um, and then yeah. you get so it's basically an ATM that you withdraw your money in coins, which in the U.S. you know it's twenty five cents is our largest coin that we use day to day. You know the quarter, uh -huh. so it's it's quite you know withdrawing like twenty bucks is is you know a handful <laughs> of quarters. I see. Um, and the bells go off. We you know we recreated the whole thing. Um, so. But that's that's a great that's a great idea, and you have a great point that actually the the board computer that used to be like thirty centimeters wide, nowadays you can replace it basically with a single Arduino if you have some something to handle yeah. uh, the outputs uh, for lamps and engines. But otherwise, the the computing can be done uh, with a with a. And the reason like... we had to do that, I really didn't want to do that because the board actually does a fair amount. It took us a long time to replicate all the various pieces of the the sound and the reels spinning and the lights going off and all and you know the coin uh -huh. mechanisms and all of this the reason we I did that imagine. was because 
there were so many things that were configurable on this machine, but the one thing that was not easily configurable was the win percentage. That is of regulated course. by the Las Vegas Gaming Commission, and it's on yeah. a chip that's like sealed, and there's just there. It was not obvious how to modify that at all. It was a uh -huh. fixed winning percentage, and you would have to swap the entire chip to something else. And you know, you can't get a hundred percent win chip that doesn't exist. So. Yeah, this this machine actually has a settings that allows you to like uh, tamper the winning rate, but it oh. allows only a certain like uh, range of like yeah. I don't know if it's 20 20 percent plus minus five or something like that. So uh, you don't have you don't have that freedom to make it. Yeah, I love yeah. the idea. It's just so good because yeah. you are combining the 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 spirit of money machine with uh, with yeah. the with the game stuff. So that's really good. Uh, thanks for the and taking away the ability from the the slot machine to to steal from you. Yeah, actually, that's that's yeah. very yeah. I, I admire it. That's good. <laughs> that's yeah. very yeah. good. Awesome. awesome. Well, maybe yeah. a thanks little bit of inspiration for where you go next. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we will. Well, and maybe so maybe much once for, for showing us. Uh, yeah, it, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and uh, what time is it where you guys are? I suspect it's fairly late. Okay, so so, so let me check. It's uh, 10 p.m., so it's not that awesome. late. It's like awesome. Uh, well, it's thanks like, for calling uh, in. Yeah. No, this okay, is awesome. thank you very much, and yeah. uh, enjoy the rest of the day or the evening or whenever you are. <laughs> we will. Yeah, I'm in the thank U.S., so it's so it's uh, early afternoon for me. And thank you to Skate oh. Rat for uh, manning the camera here. And for, oh for yeah. This uh, so yeah, much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Bye. See you next time. Okay. See you next time. And we'd love to see whatever this turns into. So, uh, yeah, please. Come okay. Noted. When, when you, when, when you do. turn it into something else. Awesome. Okay. That is fantastic. I, now that I have done the big slot machine project that I did, I have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for, for gambling machines. Not because I like gambling. Um, I'm not particularly fond of it. Um, and, and, Slot machines will totally just steal from you. There are no tricks. They will absolutely take your money. Um, but the construction of them is very interesting, particularly the old vintage machines. And there's so many stories behind them. We found this amazing, we showed it in the video, but I'm gonna show it up again because I just think it's so cool. If you are in the Bay Area, you should go by Squires and Corey slot machine dealer. They're like down the peninsula. They're sort of halfway up the peninsula in San Francisco, Squires and Corey. And uh, it is, it's like one part slot machine store, one part antique store. I mean, it's just incredible. There are slot machines everywhere. Uh, and they completely refurbish slot machines there. And so I got a, when we were going down to get a machine, I got a little bit of a tour. Um, and it's just, it's just packed to the ceiling full of parts and old vintage pieces and things. Um, they have little workshops tucked away. It's not that big a space, but um, it's absolutely incredible. Worth worth a stop if you're into sort of vintage mechanical stuff. And the owner is an absolute character. Um, we just we had a ton of fun talking to him and and uh, learning learning about machines. I think we've got uh, Patrick ready to show something off here. If you're ready, Patrick, give me a thumbs up on on your camera. Sweet. Hey there, how's it going? We hear you. I don't know if we've got audio. Don't have audio on your end. All right, I'm gonna let you guys sort that out, and then we'll give me a thumbs up or a chat once you got that working. Um, but we'll get him on here. He's got something cool to show off. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let me check through chat here. Sorry. Oh, there's a lot of pinned things that I did not see. reading back your chat here. We covered most of these things. Oh, this is a good idea. Um, I wish we'd I'd noticed this in time to highlight it, but that thing could be a very cool jukebox. Um, that would be pretty awesome. Um, yeah, sorry, Mods. I, I should have checked the pin comments. Um, I think we hit on a lot of these things, but um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I still don't think you have audio. You should see 
Patrick, you should see the bar um, beneath your image on the side. Uh, it, if you look at mine, the green dots imply sound. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, lots of good good commentary in the in the comments in the in the chat. So thank you all. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to highlight it all. There was a bit of a delay, so it was hard for me to kind of interject. Um, yeah. Um, this looks like info from someone who's working on the on the machine we just saw. When we started, the CPU was dead. We were afraid that the EEPROMs were fried and that it would have been a dead end. Yeah, that would be pretty rough. Um, but it was just the probably reset line rotten away, holding it floating. So yeah, we'll figure something out. The evening is young. I love it. I love the the uh, hackathon hackerspace ethos going on over there. Um, yeah. Uh, I know Patrick's working on getting his audio working. Um, thank you. I I love this carpet too. I don't know what it's a photo of, but it's something pretty high speed because there are a bunch of like signal matching lines here, uh, length matching and impedance matching, where they're they're creating these squiggles on the traces to make sure that multiple traces that have signals that are related to each other are exactly the same length. Um, so when they turn corners and stuff, um, I found it. I was gonna like do my own custom rug, and that was gonna turn into a project. So I found this on Society Six. Um, I'm not sure I have a link right now, but I have shared a link at various points. Um, yeah. Seems like we've got a lot of Germans on, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I'm guessing a motherboard, like a laptop or something. It's pretty big um, in terms of like traces and sort of exposed traces. So I think, I think laptop is plausible. Probably not a phone, um, but yeah, hard to say. It would be cool to know. Uh, yeah. What else we got? Patrick, your audio working yet? I don't see any green bars. Okay. Not yet. Um, what else do I have? Oh, I have a little thing. I um <clears throat> some of you might have seen in my videos or in other people's videos, uh like the work mats, the silicone work mats. I just got a new one. Um, I needed a second one because I I have one project on one that I very carefully moved out of the way so I could work on something else. And uh, I just got a new one. It was more expensive. You can get the the light blue ones, which I can't show you because it's got something on it right now. And I've got all the screws and all the little trays. But I got this one because it claims it's anti-static. Um, uh, so uh, I paid like 30 bucks for this, which is more than I should have. But I thought it was interesting. And I wanted to try out some like all the blue ones are pretty much the same, like two or three designs. And so I wanted to try out something a little a little higher end, supposedly. Um, and uh, I thought of actually making my own version of this because I have yet to find the perfect one. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so chat's saying like anti-static, well, yeah, it's silicone, but silicone's not by default conductive, right? It's insulating. So they must be doing something to make it conductive. I don't know a ton about silicone, but the idea is that, I mean, they give you a grounding strap for your hand, but also that you just clip to the corner of the pad. And then they give you one of these cool things, which I don't know if you've seen before is, is this crazy Frankenstein thing that you plug into a wall and you just use the grounding pin on that. And I guess you're just supposed to jam this in there. Yeah. So that's where you get your ground from. So yeah, um, I'm eager to play with it more. I'm trying to figure out, okay, what what are the features that I really like about these and what are the features that I don't? Like, what would I change? Because um, I, I like the idea of it, and yet in practice, uh, they don't sort of end up having the right holes and things. They're not great to solder on because like if you if you put hot air on the middle section here, this one claims it's, it's um, you can solder on it, but I found when you when you put hot air in the middle, it expands and that causes it to bubble up and it moves moves your work. So, um, so I don't know. That's something to play with more. Um, if you search online, you could find these like silicone work mat or something. The the sort of sky blue is the is the one you'll typically find, um, and there are a couple different varieties of those, and they're they're okay. They're fine. 
Um, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So the idea is to do, to do my own version, um, as merch, um, would be the, would be the goal. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, would be a great way to support the channel and, um, would be useful. Yeah, totally. I just need to kind of refine what, what the design should look like. So, um, yeah. Um, there's some talk around Congress. Um, so people are asking, am I going to, um, Congress this year? Am I going to camp? So if you don't know what these are, Congress, these are, um, the largest European, um, hacker events. So Congress happens every year between Christmas and New Year's, um, for four days. Uh, it used to be, well, I've been when it's in Hamburg and in Leipzig, and now it's going back to Hamburg this year. Um, uh, camp is a week long and it happens every four years. Um, and it's a week long, uh, um, sort of camping in tents out in a field in the German countryside and hacking. There's ethernet to every tent. There's like gigabit or 10 gigabit ethernet to every tent and, um, you know, a crazy internet connection and hanging out with a bunch of hackers for a week. Um, and at both of these things, there are talks, but, but as much, uh, the talks are almost less important than just hanging out and meeting people and, and hacking on cool stuff and whatnot. Um, the answer is I don't know. The reality is the time of year that Congress is between Christmas and New Year's, I believe it starts uh, December 26th and then goes through the 30th, I guess, because um, it's four days. Uh, it's, really, it's really hard if you're not already in Europe to make it there, um, particularly with the holidays. If you plan on spending Christmas with your family, um, it's when I've gone, and I've gone two years, I think, I've almost always had to fly on Christmas, which kind of sucks. Um, so, and flights are expensive and stuff. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go. I do like it a lot, um, but I feel like it's not particularly well suited to the Americans attending um, or from Asia for that matter. But um, uh, Christmas is less of a problem if I'm coming in from Asia. Uh, in terms of camp, um, that uh that might happen we'll see we'll see i i have to see what, how my schedule turns out but uh the tricky one with that is it's hard to bring camping gear on the plane but um but i'm sure we can figure something out so maybe 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 um yeah um so yeah there's some people speculating that maybe this this mat has graphite added to the silicone and um and to make it conductive and i think that's very possible actually we can answer this question really quick maybe not on camera but i can tell you the results which is i have a multimeter here let's just see so this one is i'm gonna use the measurement it's got a ruler on it we'll just measure centimeter and it doesn't look conductive at all not at these voltages anyway Okay, now I question whether this thing is actually BS or not. I mean, maybe it has to be tested at a higher voltage. I don't know, very, like, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not convinced it's conductive at all. Okay, well, that answers that question. <laughs> uh, I might, uh, yeah, that would be an interesting test. I wonder if they're just selling a scam. Um, yeah. <laughs> Scape Rat says the people at Congress are family. And yes, that is definitely true. Um, but also, yeah, it's uh, sometimes nice to spend the holiday with your family too. Um, Let's see. I think Patrick's trying to get my attention. Don't know whether he has audio working yet. I'm not seeing any bars over there. Holler if wave again if you've got your audio working, Patrick. I'm not seeing it. All right. Uh let's see. So yeah, people are suggesting. Um, 
to buy camping gear locally instead of flying over with it, which is an option. Um, it's just, it's, it's logistics. Yeah. Oh, okay. I won't see any audio signal from Patrick until he's live. So let's just try this again. All right. Okay. Oh, there we go. It works. Okay, great. Good. It only Good took a reboot big screen. for this to work. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. That's like the audio visual nightmare that this, you know, at the start of every Zoom meeting, right? Like, yes, exactly. The the video conferencing tax. It is yeah, also applies to streaming. And then yep. like nothing works. Hello. Yes. Hello, welcome. Okay. Welcome, welcome. Good. Good. We actually spoke on the phone this morning, but uh, it's great to have you on stream as well. I I, uh, I bullied you into showing something off. I mean, I was doing this anyway, so I am uh, like this is extremely convenient for for both parties. Um, Excellent. I was going to be spending my Saturday like doing this anyway, so showing it off uh, is definitely um, perfect. It's definitely a reasonable detour. Um, perfect. Should I bring up your second camera here? Yeah, all right. Let's. Uh, yeah. I can't okay. see what it shows, no, but yeah, I'm going to basically. Any. So, um, Oops, yeah, that's today I wanted, to do. I wanted to show uh, my setup for digitizing film at home. So, a couple of uh, months. Like, for, sorry, say that again. You broke up right when you announced what it was. All righty. Uh, I don't know if I can get like a better aspect on this, or I'm going to have to just stand further back, but. Um, yeah, so this is a little DIY setup that I have built for digitizing uh, 35 uh, millimeter um, film at home. So uh, in the last year, um, since last summer, uh, I've like taken a big dive into analog photography and uh, to try and keep the to reduce the uh, amount of waiting, um, you know, for like lab turnaround work. I've decided to basically do as much of the process as possible at home, and that includes now developing and, and scanning. And so um, I um, recently constructed this little frame for um, mounting my DSLR camera on the little uh, worm screw uh, macro stage. Uh, and this combined with this uh, like uh, lighting uh, pad that is like typically used for, I guess, like you know, illuminating people in, you know, streaming setups or whatever the case. Uh, I use this to backlight the uh, negative and the combination of this allows me to get some pretty decent uh, scans. So this is, I guess, like a 26 megapixel camera. The aspect ratios, thankfully, for 35 mil uh, film and the like sensor are um, uh, like they're, they're the same sort of landscape ratio. So you get a pretty... Yeah. If you can get a one-to-one -one, uh, macro lens, so this is a 50 uh, mil uh, lens that allows me to get a one-to-one. -one, um, uh, what is the technical term I'm looking for here? Basically, I want uh, uh, the uh, sensor size to uh, map as closely as possible to the surface area that I'm trying to scan. And this yeah. uh, uh, zoom macro uh, setup allows it to happen um so the size yeah. of the of the negative that you're taking a picture of is the same size as the sensor it's like roughly the same size as the sensor yep. so yeah one to one um like ratio between the thing that you're scanning and the sensor size is like what you want for the greatest uh like capture quality and like usage of yep. the you know, full resolution capture um so yeah, it's it's iterated a little while, a, a little bit. I was starting out with like three D printed uh, uh, jigs. So these um, allow you to pass the whoops. These allow you to pass the uh, film in through a little channel here, and then it's held mostly flat. Um, you know, suspended above a light source for you to um, for you to then um, photograph. Um, I found though that. This uh, 3D printed frame was a little bit hard to use, particularly because you need a fair amount of negative to um, navigate through the S-curve. So you, if you can imagine, there's a little S-curve that is used to feed the film in and then eventually put it into a, yeah. a horizontal plane. And uh, particularly when you're cutting the negatives and you have these like frames at the end, it can be yeah. hard to uh, it can be hard to manipulate. Um, so I've ended up using a. Uh, commercially available uh, option that has like much finer 
oh, nice. <laughs> manufacturing tolerances that my 3D yeah. printer can uh, produce. And so, yeah, this is like much, much, much nicer. Um, but yeah, and this, the, the setup um, is pretty uh, stable. One of my big, so the big factors that you have with scanning negatives relate to how bright you can backlight the negative and also um, how, like stability, right? Vibration is a, is a killer for uh, sharpness. Um, this is a problem because I live in a 1920s wood framed uh, building in San Francisco. So I don't know, somebody sneezes outside and I can probably uh, catch it. And so my initial, uh, my initial attempts at this were pretty bad. I, I used um, this little like backlight, uh, uh, you know, uh, contact sheet, you know, uh, so, uh, tray like a light as the source. Yeah, as a yeah, light, light source, light but it's yep. it's pretty too it's pretty anemic compared to to this thing. Uh, and then also, I was using a uh, my tripod in an inverted uh, setup and um, aligning that, um, and you know, it was not great at. Uh, it was not great at maintaining an alignment, nor was it uh, uh, very good at vibration dampening. So, yeah. Um, yeah and you whole... have problems. You want it. You want the camera, the the sensor plane, to be per exactly parallel to the negative. Right? Yeah. So, the so the trick issue. for the trick for doing that is, and I found this on a forum, and it changed my life. So, uh, let me turn this back on. So, the trick for doing that is to get a mirror, um, and to use the live live view uh of the camera to so let me get the focus here to so the the live view has a uh diagonal cross and you yeah. want to basically align this like with the center of the uh with the center of the aperture and having done so you know that you are now uh regardless of like what the surfaces are i was previously using a, a spirit level to do this but yeah. The surface itself might not necessarily be horizontal and I don't, or it might not be perfectly level and I don't particularly care. What I care about is whether these two surfaces are perpendicular to each other. And so this yeah. mirror alignment actually makes this a lot easier and just quicker to do than fussing yeah. around with spirit levels. That's um, awesome. Yeah. It's so simple and yeah, yet I don't, so brilliant. Like, when you see it, you're like, oh, this is so obvious. Uh, and you know, yeah. it's like a $2 mirror that I got at the uh, Ace Hardware like store to, Brick of five or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, That's awesome. And so then, you know, once you once you have that, I'll swap out the um, the mirror for the like little film holder. Um, I'm at the moment. So one of the, one of the other issues that I'm trying to control for is you can obviously see that the surface area of the light is much larger than that of the film holder, and yeah. that produces quite a lot of glare. Uh, so at the moment, I'm 3D printing a. Uh, a jig which will basically box off the the rest of the light while also suspending the uh, the film holder a little above the light to allow for a bit of diffusion and um, more diffuse yeah. light gives um, clear scans for yeah. properties of optics that I like f cannot understand uh, and haven't I just need to be a technician in that regard I just need to know that like if you raise it a little bit you get better scans yeah um, and yeah. and yeah so the the process of like if I tape this down, you can run a little negative through it from left to right, and combined with a uh, you know a little remote um, trigger for the uh, scanning, you can get through a roll of thirty-five mil in you know, twenty minutes or so, or, or less. It's a very pleasant activity awesome. with a with an album or uh, you know a beverage. Yep. Is the is the time mostly taken up just handling the negatives and, and getting them aligned and into the jig? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I also wanted to 3D print a jig um, is to just allow me to draw. Uh, so when it's all uh, just like sitting, um, you know, loose, the yeah. uh, like pulling the uh, negative through is enough to drag the oh. whole jig out of alignment across the surface of the light. And so part of the uh, Part of the hope of printing the blank uh, and jig is that it'll hold it all in place and it'll allow me to more just continually pull it through and do it in an even quicker action. And yeah. I also would like to, so I do print, or sorry, I do take, um, I have a, 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 a panoramic camera that takes a film panoramas. So it's a, it's a little wind-up toy. Um, oh. 
Yeah. Okay. Look, this is worthwhile showing off. In fact. Okay. Yes. 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 Please. Yeah, give me, please give me do. Two seconds. Yep. Uh, people are asking. Um, uh, just uh, answer this while Patrick's fetching that. Um, this is not just a Scotty and Friends show and tell. Um, this is a regular thing, and anybody can show off um, things that they'd like to. So uh, if you'd like to show something off, you can go to uh, this link here, and you can even show it off right now, or you can show it off next week. We do this every week, uh, Saturdays at noon Pacific. Um, you can go to this link here, strangeparts.com slash show and tell. Just give us a little bit of information about what you want to show, um, and you can join the stream and be live with me. Um, or uh, you can show your face, you can not, not show your face, or you can just upload some photos or a video, and um, and I'll take a look and, and react to it live. So um, please join us. Um, we'd love to have you. All righty, better situated. Looks like... Right, looks like Patrick's back here. All righty. <clears throat> So um, yeah, so this little thing here is whoops, a, uh, a film panoramic camera, and it is uh, all mechanical. Um, it's like a wind-up toy, like Woody. Um, so I'm gonna. Uh, can you make my uh, primary cool. camera bigger so I can like use yes. two hands and operate yes, it? Because yes. it'll be even more satisfying when you hear yes. the clicks. And um, so basically, the idea is that. Uh, crazy. Film will go in the back here. I have to um, open it. I forget how. This is super cool. Oh my god. Well, sorry. First of all, the idea is that film uh, is loaded in the back here. It's drawn across the surface of a very, very small, uh, like, ex light exposure strip. Yeah. And then it's wound. So like a slit here. Yeah. Like very, very small slit. slit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here mm -hmm. you can see just like that the center, that's where the, the aperture is that describes yeah. the area of the film that is exposed as, as it's passed over. Does it and have so, a yeah. lens or just the slit? It has a tiny, tiny little lens. Yeah. So basically okay. you're controlling two apertures that it describes as cloudy or sunny. Um, so, you know, pick your <laughs> picture, just uh, awesome. do it well. Uh, the idea is that you would control the exposure by the speed at which you would allow the film to oh pass sure it. so okay. if you want to get a really if it's really bright out you know you'll rip it but if it's yep. uh, you know if you're indoors you might let it uh slowly um rotate yep. and so um the in the center here there's a shaft and it's connected via a rubber ring to the other to the uh, another shaft that is winding the film so for every uh rotation of the um, main camera around the central shaft, the film is winding in concert with it. And so you can okay. hear this yep. clicking. Uh, so it's ratcheting because it doesn't want you to uh, like go backwards and unwind the film. Yeah. But, sure. uh, and it's you want it to be going at a set, set rate. Yep. And so uh, the idea is that you will. Uh, <laughs> You'll uh, put film in and just you know hold it there and whoops there you go around. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's. I it's love a it. Lot, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I highly recommend looking out for these. Um, I think they've, they're still sold. They're by a group called Lomography that do like sort of toy cameras and other other things. That's but so awesome. It generates that looks absolutely super fun. Incredible photos. Um, I'll try and find some and put them in the uh, Discord. Okay, now I have it open so we yep. can see the inside. Yeah. So. Um, so for every rotation here, you can see that there's a yeah. corresponding rotation oh, yeah, in the, yeah. in the, uh, film advance over here. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, yeah, you can even see the light, uh, that describes the like aperture for the film That's being so awesome. So simple. Have you gotten um, good results out of it? Yeah. 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 Great results. Um, I surely I have some on, I, I will, I'll, look for some and put them in the okay like it would take me too long to find them Pretty and it would be boring to let to watch me look but i th you get some really fun results um particularly when you do off angle um you know orthogonal uh like relations to the horizontal pr give or sorry to the horizon give fun results right so you can either get like uh 360 results around you or um it's oh. fun honestly to do vertical ones where you get a double horizon yeah. because it'll be both like the ground in front of you and then you know this the, the world above you and then behind you so you get this yeah uh, 
One of my favorites is, you know, there's two large uh, trees near the entrance of Golden Gate Park, uh, near where I live, that I walk quite frequently. And so there's a large vertical photo that sort of captures the the full like grandeur of these trees that are 100 and something years old. And That's like, awesome. like and the you sky. And you get a cool distortion effect as well of like, yeah. Um, yeah, you get some interesting perspective effects. That's really yeah. cool. And it's, I don't know, it's something, how many photos do you get on a film? Yeah. Um, about, uh, it depends what, on how, uh, about eight or nine, or maybe fewer. Okay. Um, it kind of depends on how complete the rotations are. Sometimes it's possible for you to do a, like almost a half one. And so you'll get much like uh, sometimes when you load a normal film camera, you'll get maybe an extra exposure or two. You right, might like sure. squeeze one extra there, but you can budget on around like eight or nine for a 36 exposure, like a regular 36 exposure, 35 mil uh, canister will get you around eight or nine. Um, That's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's funny when you when you ask the lab to develop uh, all of your film, but not to cut it into the assorted strips, they give it to you in like a takeout box that's used for curry. It's just like in a, it's like in a in a stool. Uh, as I was walking home with this little uh, takeout box, so that I could cut it. Um, yep. I used to get uncut negatives just back in a film canister. They'd wind them up and stick them in a film canister. Mm. Give them back to me that way. Um, yeah, there's like, uh, it's fun to just go to the lab and see how they do it and compare against the yeah. what I can get done here at home as well. Um, yeah. Honestly, the chemistry is very reminiscent of uh, being back in high school. I think my. Uh, yes. My high school teacher would be looking down on me, uh, proud to see me getting temperature and time right. Yep, yep. I did Solid. lots of that. Uh, not so much in high school, but in but in college. Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of time in the in the dark room. Uh, uh, someone's asking, um, can you rotate it? Rambling Geeks asking, uh, can you rotate it more slowly? Yeah. So you you like, can control the um, you can control the release oh, more slowly okay. if you want. So pretty slowly. Yeah, um, and I have seen people. Uh, create um, gear like uh, electrical mechanisms that will rotate yeah. it on a set yeah. frequency. Um, so if you wanted to put it in the middle of a dining table at like a party, for example, you get a nice, you know, uh, panorama of all your guests. Um, there typically wouldn't be enough light in those scenarios. Um, yeah. For like film exposures to really work. That's where digital cameras like really come out to yeah. play. Um, yeah. But yeah, people do really fun stuff with it. Um, I guess like their whole idea is that film allows you to do things that digital sensors don't really. Um, yeah. I mean, you could do this with a digital sensor, but it would require a lot of engineering work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, yeah, there's something very, um, I don't know, serendipitous about working mm -hmm. with film. That, yeah. yeah you can do some really fun stuff. Um, also watching people capture or play with time with this format as well. So like capture a moving yeah. cyclist through a scene, but to watch the scene blur behind them. Um, yep. You know, there's, there's things that are, I don't know, different ways of seeing the world. Usually film, um, digital, uh, we are like, we are very uh, used to film, um, or sorry, digital images, like capturing perfection of the scene that we see. And it's interesting yes. to play with a format that uh, specifically doesn't do that, that yeah, like totally. has some play in the process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun experimenting with, with film, mostly in college, but you know, things like um, taking, uh red green and blue filters and shooting a triple exposure one mm. through a red filter one through a green filter and one through a blue filter which if you balance your filters just right you get the normal trunk. looking color image right you, but anything that has moved in between your exposures is only one of the colors mm -hmm. and so you get these cool like colored ghosts in a otherwise you know more or less normal looking color image um, which I suppose you could do with digital too, but it's, it's, yeah, no, I, working there's with the a lot of fun gets you thinking in a different way. Yep. Um, um I, I'm very keen to, uh, I need a filter to get the best results out of it, but I have some infrared sensitive film that I'm very, uh, excited to, uh, I use. love infrared. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, infrared's very cool. Yeah. So, so this is like where, f um, anything that's like really lush and green, you know, in the, like, uh, like greenery in the forestry around you is like lovely to shoot in infrared because it's that extra uh reflect i guess it's the extra um absorption of infrared and in, by the green like colors makes it more yes. like contrasty in that 
uh, well, it like, actually is reflecting like, off a significant amount of infrared light. Yeah. Um, and so there's just this yeah, the whole darker other color, color is reflecting more infrared that we're yeah. seeing, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it makes things look look totally. They look sort of otherworldly and almost sort of you know like a ghost world almost. Yeah. Um, you can see veins under people's skin if you do portraiture. Um, yep. Yeah, it's wild, and it's just it's just a film that's um, sensitive to infrared light, and then you put um, an infrared a filter on the camera that only allows infrared light to go yep. through um because infrared film is also sensitive to every other spectrum um and then you just get crappy pictures like you don't get anything interesting if you let everything yep. else through the hard part <laughs> is that if you have an slr where your your viewfinder looks through the lens you can't see anything when, when you yeah have you have to do all of your focusing first uh yeah. it's much like using a, a really, really yeah it's much like using a very uh high factor like neutral density filter it's like yes. if you wanted to do very, very long uh, exposures with like a 10 stop density filter, yeah. you, know, you effectively can't see anything through it. So you're doing like this pre-focusing and um, yeah, it's playing with time, um, both with digital and film. Um, I would highly encourage everybody to like to do so. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. I'm just looking through chat here to see if there's any. Uh, there's probably some the other there. stuff that's like extremely um, exciting in the results that it produces, but it's, you know, unobtainium is aerochrome. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a, uh, it's a type, it's a variant of, infra it's like a variant, a family uh, of infrared sensitive film that was used for forestry and surveillance photography because it specifically is very high contrast between um, like green areas and, uh, yeah. you know, non-green areas around it, um, but specifically- it black and white or color? It's color. It makes the greenery yeah. look red. Um, so you get this like extremely um, another really yeah, like a false use... color sort of. Yeah, because this false color spectrum in red of, of things that are usually like green yeah. foliage um, yeah. looks really incredible for uh, for forest fire photography um, in terms of being able to assess uh, the like damage of uh, yeah. like forest fires from a great height. Um, there's another use I've seen of it. Um, there's some really spectacular shots of Australia um, from like early 2020. Um, uh, HRH Ginsburg Bush says uh, the advantage of the film is that you can maximize it into infinity versus digital where you're limited by the megapixel stored. And actually, I mean, it's sort of true, but it's not fully true, right? Depending on the speed of the film you're using, right? The film is little, it's little silver particles. Embedded? Yeah, I think in, so, in most black and white, it's silver halide is the light sensitive yeah. um, chemical. And it's like the grain size of that is ultimately what. Right. It's essentially your, your resolution, right? Yeah. So yeah, you can, it, you can blow it up as much as you want. But if you're using really fast film, which has large grains, you're going to be, those are essentially become your yeah. pixels. So it's really cool to look at under a microscope. And honestly, because you, you do see the individual grains of, uh, and where you know how the image is made up of these specks of individual yep. like uh, reagents that are light sensitive that have been developed that have been fixed in place, yeah. and then the rest of it has been washed away. Um, yeah, it's really. Um, I think the the like the resolution of of a like thirty five mil print like well scanned um, or a thirty five mil negative well scanned. I think is you can get up to like a two to three foot uh, wide print out of it. Um, Medium format and beyond is is where it's like really. Yeah. So incredible. that's medium format is when your negative is much larger. So you yeah, essentially so have step up. an increased resolution. Right? Yeah. So you have like six by six centimeters or six by four and a half compared to, I mean, 35 millimeter by 24 is like the rough uh, size yeah. of the exposed area on a 35 mil negative. Yeah. And then but you the can full go exposed go all area. the way up to eight by 10 in a large format. Yeah. yeah. Medium, medium and large format are. Uh, I mean, really, really high resolution, like archival, uh, you know, will stand the test of time. <laughs> yes. Uh, sort of thing. But also a huge pain in the neck to, to actually photograph with. You know, you're carrying around a very large camera and you usually only have a kind of a couple exposures per, yep. per yep. session. No, yeah. I mean, 35 mil was like that peak. You know, you had 36 exposures in a canister that's like this small. And then the introduction yeah. of two hour color chemistry meant that, or one hour color chemistry meant that, you know, every pharmacy or you know like on the corner could turn around like it's actually amazing to think back at the economies 
and like the whole system that went into making yeah. one hour uh, film so uh, popular, so common. I mean, yeah, I'm really fortunate to live in a place where there's still labs, but yeah. uh, like it used to be everywhere. Mostly. Yeah. It used to yeah. be absolutely, um, you know, yeah. you could a 15 minute, you were a 15 minute drive or walk from somewhere that would do color chemistry. Like yeah. absolutely. Yeah, totally. Totally. There were um, booths in malls. Says, someone else says, um, if you have a really small exposure and less light, you have less detail. And yes, if it, if it is exposed properly, then you're making up for that by either large a faster film which is larger mm -hmm. silver halide grains or you're um over processing the film yeah so i actually did this just you're doing push processing night. push processing yeah i did this for the first yeah. time uh this last week so it's effectively cooking your film longer in the developers so that the contrast in the scene is more pronounced um yeah. it like shifts the uh exposure curve if you can imagine there's an x an s curve of uh of uh, shadows and highlights and the uh, like midtones of where a film is capturing um, light and you can take black and white well, actually I think you can do it in both black and white and color but in, it's more common uh, I think in black can. and white film yeah. um, to get this to have this concept of push processing where you effectively bake it for a little bit longer in the developer at a slightly higher temperature and the contrast of the film is greater and so that means that shadows become more pronounced, but any light in the scene is really blown out. So you get this really, yeah. I don't know, it feels very punchy. Uh, I've, I was very impressed by the results. I would definitely do it again. Um, and That's it's awesome. noticeable. I'll have to post a photo uh, side by side on the um, on the light screen because it's noticeable the like differing contrast ratios between like an average Interesting. photo. I didn't, I didn't realize how much it changed, changed contrast. I used to use it when I couldn't get access to high, high speed film. Um, yeah, you, you can, know, you I can even notice it in like, situations. Yeah, you can even notice it in the development of the technical information. So like the, you know, the stamping of the film manufacturer and the stock is like more, uh, I don't know, it, like it has almost like a glow around it because it has, it, it, because it has been like overdeveloped um, compared to yeah. the, the other. So like it really makes everything oh, stand out. Got it. You can actually see it on the negative of yeah. where the manufacturer has already pre-exposed the, the yeah. you know, frame numbers or whatever they're going to yeah, put on so, there. Film te t many oh, film manufacturers have like technical information here. I can take a photo of it that is encoded on the film, and it gives you uh, sometimes a little. Uh, oh, am I resumed? I think I'm resumed. I don't know if I'm facing down. Yes. Whoops. Uh, let's see if I can do this in the the top of the uh, film here. We'll have little numbers aligning the scene or the technical information. I don't know if it is it mirrored yeah, for you yeah. or mirrored for me. Maybe both. I'm not sure. It's it, we don't have quite good enough resolution for us to be able to see it. Yeah, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Um, calling back to your scanning uh, work, um, uh, HRH Getterbush says there there was once even a semi-automated scanning device add-ons. But this one looks much higher quality. Yeah, I had a I had a film scanner that was about yay big. It was, it was a box about like this a desktop big. unit. Uh huh. It was scuzzy, mm. and uh, like the old like printer scuzzy cable, and um and it had, I think it would take a strip of five, uh frames of of, um thirty five millimeter or a single mounted slide, and it had a slot and if you were using you know a strip of film and not a mounted slide it had like a plastic holder that you'd put it in you'd put your five frames in and then uh i think you would manually line up which frame you wanted to be on mm -hmm. and then it would automatically scan but it did a you know like an old flatbed scanner sweep yeah like through um, yeah and then yeah there were i mean i'm sure the film labs have automated scanners where they can feed an entire roll through um, I know that it is more expensive to have pre-cut negatives scanned um, yep. than it is mm -hmm. to have uncut because they can just feed it in and go. And then yeah, it's... there's definitely some cheering in the chat um, for you to, to, to add some servos onto this. So yeah, there, uh, once I have everything fixed, um, yeah, there is uh, there's two things that I want to automate. 
a the the uh, dragging the negatives through the jig so that I can advance them in like fixed increments for taking an X photo, and the second is um, the agitation of the chemistry in the tank oh, yes. that I use. Um, yeah. The tank uh, allows for um, like rotational processing. So if you just set it on a set it on its side and, and constantly rotationally agitate it, you can use about half yeah. the chemicals that you would need yes. if you're uh, um, constantly turning it over on your uh, manually. And so yeah. it would also allow me to step away and not be constantly uh, rotating a piece of plastic for a couple of minutes. So yeah, yeah. There, there are things crying out to being automated here. <laughs> like it's a perpetual uh, project. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Totally. Totally. Awesome. Well, this is pretty sweet. Thank you for for taking the time. I'm just seeing if there's any more chat Thanks questions here. Um, yeah. Do you wanna um? Do you wanna actually? Are you set up to actually do the scanning process on a negative? I can show. Cool yeah. I mean, it. I can like roughly show the process and. Yeah. and the Question is, let me uh, orient a camera towards it because I don't have a third hand. That's my only problem, right? Looks now. like we have another O'Doherty in the chat here. Oh wow! C C O'Doherty. I can tell which I can tell which one that is. Yeah, this one is C E and P. Yep. It's the triumvirate. Right. Excellent. Uh, Good to see you, Connor. Thanks for joining Connor. the stream. All right. So I hope yeah, I'm not I hope I'm not outing you against your will. <laughs> uh, let's. So basically, it goes a little bit like this. I mean, I'll I'll do this a little bit rough, just so we can see the whole process. Um, whoops, it is. You do not break a mirror. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll typically um, do this in a slightly darker room so that I don't have any yeah. uh, don't have any glare. But uh, and I use these lint free gloves to handle the negatives so that I'm not constantly uh, leaving dust on them. You can get them on yeah. uh, AliExpress for obscene reasonable prices. Um, doo -doo -doo. But they are to be semi disposable. Yeah, uh, but they are, of course, slightly tight fitting uh, for my hands. Classic. Um, <laughs> And then because they're coming from AliExpress. Yeah, I'm sure that they are made for uh, not me. Um, and so yeah, I'll typically take a negative. We'll uh, expose it emulsion side uh, down. Which way it is? Emulsion emulsion side up, rather reflective side down. Uh, so it's mirrored. And then I'll feed it through a little holder here. Um, I use live view to line everything up and get a nice nice focus in the center. Uh, usually I use the this worm screw at the top here for finer adjustments okay. because and that's uh, a stand you built yourself after you got frustrated with the, the track. Yeah so the right? the stand is built from uh, 2020 um, standard extrusion um, yeah. and it's just you know little uh, U with an upright here, and the uh, tripod mount. There's uh, this is a standard, uh, like a tripod. There's a term for it in the photography world that I'm absolutely blanking on, but it's a standard, uh, like clamp for uh, tripod mounts that have this yep. groove uh, uh, channel dug into the uh, uh, brick that connects to the bottom of the camera, and so it allows me to connect the. Um, macro uh, stage because this is way, way, way finer detailed uh, adjustment than anything I can accomplish with the uh, the actual like even touching this like brushes it enough to move it in pretty substantial yeah. uh, increments and so the macro uh, lens and stage allows me to get way, way, way finer. Oh, that's uh, awesome! With like I think it was like thirty bucks. It was probably one of the, the more uh, uh, impactful additions to the setup. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, once I have everything lined up, it's a uh, uh, trigger. You know, I'll take three exposures. Um, and then I go, I use um, a plugin in Adobe Lightroom in post to do the negative to positive conversion. Yeah. Uh, and I keep the. Why do you do three photos just for shake? 
to yeah just for shakes you know. yeah yeah just yeah it's like three gives me a high a reasonably high probability that uh something you know hasn't uh, gone wrong with one of them, them is good <laughs> yeah my i think my uh the two things that have made a huge difference in the um efficiency of this last months are this jig this light and also lightroom introduced the most amazing content aware uh fixing tools that are i guess ai driven in some sense in some manner yeah. That allows for dust removal. That is really oh, that's awesome. Really amazing. Um, it's it's like a, a an AI assisted version of the um, the previous like uh, photo adjust tools, like copy and replace, but with some yeah. like uh, calculated filling in. Um, yeah. And that that's really amazing because it saves me on having to like get this whole process out get, again. I usually do this all in one go. I'll do a couple of rolls in a go, and then I will sit down and QA all of it. And, That's awesome. Uh, it's nice to have like a higher hit rate such that the whole thing doesn't have to come out again uh, just because, you know, a speck of dust got in there. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the next the next thing is to have a, a some sort of uh, mechanical advance here that would, you know, two wheels with a little uh, two rubber um, like wheels, basically, just to draw the film out in and, and standard yeah. increment. And yep. uh, yeah. That's uh, that's awesome. Ideally, maybe uh, an anti-static uh, brush on the entrance here, just to like pick up any lint yeah. as it is entering. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's all about just reducing the probability of there being dust or something else on it. Um, sure. It's nice, nice to have a nice, a high hit rate of uh, quality scans. Yeah. Um, the other, the other thing that uh, non-DSLR scans have in the advantage. I can't remember exactly how it works. But they do have dust detection um, because they do a they do both an optical and an infrared scan of the negative, and they can see they can do a delta, and there is some like on scan uh, like dust correction um, in like a lot of high, a lot of high end uh, negative and photo scanners, uh, even desktop ones. Like so, your uh, you know your desktop uh, Epson whatever will yeah. have like some onboard um, like dust huh. filtering that uses. Um, That's good to know. I'm working with a really low end um, flatbed scanner right now that I picked up for like 70 bucks. Project that I'm not ready to talk about all of yet, but um, but I'm let's just say I'm using it downstairs in the dirtier parts of the shop. And uh, yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if it's doing any auto dust rec correction that I don't know about, um, which could be good or bad. Um, depending on yeah. exactly what it's doing. Um, yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, there's all, all sorts yeah. of smarts that go into optical, like tool, digital uh, scanning and other tools. I think that there's a famous story of uh, a Xerox machine that did some sort of uh, um, compression on recognized characters in scanned documents, but had you know, errors in the deduping of uh, you know, characters that it would reproduce, and so it Subtle, it would very subtly but conf confidently change like dimensions or other things in graphics because it was basically creating a reduced Amazing. glyph set from what it was observing Amazing. and then reproducing those. And so, you know, in, a, in an analog copy, you would just see, you know, sort of analog degradation, right? Like, oh, it's a smudge, so we can't recognize it as like a 42. But here it was like, no, that's definitely a 43 uh, and a printable. <laughs> Uh, I guess there was a CCC talk on it. Um, that's what what comments are showing here. Uh, uh, I, it's somewhere in my memory that this is possibly where. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Um, but. J know, Big uh, Two. It sounds like. That's it. Yeah, J Big um, Two. Um, yeah. It's. Uh, I don't know, like cautionary tale, I guess, on. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, digital digital optics and tool assists. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, the are are negatives opaque to infrared? Is that why they do an optical scan and then an infrared scan? Uh, or like what? How is that giving? I think you it's difference? dust. There's something. What is it? There is some. I mean, there's there's some image difference that is the basis yeah. for the correction. What exactly the basis of the difference is, I am unsure of, but I do believe huh. that there is some infrared component involved. Um, because it's, 
missing in DSLR scans. Right? We, we have to yeah. do all of the the dust uh, correction ourselves. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, film has seen a resurgence, and so DSLR scanning is pretty. I think yeah. it's possibly one of the most common ways that people do all of the scanning at home. That's um, fascinating. But there's this My, like how things have changed. Yeah, it's it's. I I do realize it's bizarre to go out and like in some sense, if you step back like and squint, it is bizarre to take an analog camera, go out, do the thing, come home, do the chemistry, dry it, blah blah blah, cut it, you know, scan it, and then whatever. Yeah. I like I under and then I, feed it I, into a digital camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do understand the absurdity of <laughs> yeah. it, but still, there is something very nice about being you know handling yeah. the work uh, so much. Like you feel very uh, involved in the process, but. Um, yeah, the uh, it's it's yeah it's it's a, the the gap in the market between when the professional industry like left off in the late two thousands or twenty yeah. you know maybe early twenty tens and now this resurgence means that like people are filling in the uh, the negative space with DSLR scanning and software and interesting it's really it's really cool. There is people also picking yeah. up some of the professional machines off eBay yeah. and elsewhere as as labs Rehabbing go. Them and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's like a very vibrant hobbyist community out there for us and, and all the different aspects. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Taco Dog 40K says uh, that um, they have so many medium format negatives they need to scan but don't have the equipment. I, I would imagine this would work just as well with medium format. I'm hoping, yeah. I That's my next uh, adventure. We'll be trying to do some medium format uh, scanning yeah. on this. There are, you know, similar to uh, the 35 mil setup, there's uh, 120 uh, millimeter uh, jigs that you can use for um, DSLR scanning. Uh, I think the the thing that um, is a little bit limiting is that the aspect ratio, like most uh, uh, medium format aspect ratios, are quite different to that of 35 mil uh, like uh, landscape, yeah. and so you end up having to sacrifice a fair amount of like sensor. Um, like resolution on either side of the scan yeah. to try and get like a real like medium format negatives hold a lot of optical information they're huge they're you know uh like the six by six is very very considerably larger than a you know three point something by two point something negative like sure. you can it's a huge amount of uh visual information to be scanned and so uh i think the, the big thing is like doing it justice with dslr uh setups I think that's where the flatbed pro stuff like really still reigns. Um, yeah. 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 That makes sense. Makes sense. Well, this is awesome. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming on and showing it off. It's absolutely it's, Thanks for having me. I saw your I think your first setup when I um, visited you. I don't know a while ago, like a year ago, maybe maybe six months ago. And so it's cool to see how it's evolved and how you keep sort of dialing yeah. it in and tweaking it and improving it. It's been a fun project in a project. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it'll continue to like evolve. The The next bit, as I said, is like figuring out some way of like permanently fixing this on the um, the light so that I can add the mechanics um, uh, as like on top of that base. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure there'll be awesome. plenty of hours in Fusion 360 ahead of me. Yep. Awesome. That sounds good. Well, will you post some photos that you've scanned as well as some panoramas? Uh, yeah. To Discord? yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. That's awesome. Awesome. So um, uh, here's the link. Uh, I put the link on the bottom of the screen to join Discord um, if you want to come hang out. Um, uh, Patrick's there. I'm there. I Pretty much uh, everybody you've uh, seen today is there. So and a lot of the folks in the chat. So um, lots of projects that haven't been on Show and Tell have been on Discord. And People sharing ideas and sources for cool parts and all sorts of other things. So um, come hang out with us. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon scanning scanning negatives here. Oh, I am. I'm also looking forward to this. Uh, I'm making a database and a little web app to help me uh, manage the negatives. The digital or the the analog has become digital, like in the meta and the organizing. So, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Well, enjoy. It's great. Infinite great projects. to see you on here. Yeah, All thanks. Right. All right. See ya. That was awesome. It is cool to see. Patrick's a very good friend. We know each other from uh, from the Noisebridge hackerspace in San Francisco um, back when I was involved in that. And uh, and we've stayed really good friends ever since. So um, great to see what he's up to. He's always got something, something cooking. 
So um, I guess the um, this compression issue is still present inside current Xerox machines, um, but now you can disable the feature if you want to. So, um, and I just wanted to highlight if you want to go see the talk, uh, it is David Creasel, Lies, Damned Lies, and Scans, which sounds like it's worth checking out. Someone said it's quite a funny talk here. So um, I'll definitely have to check that out. I have not seen it. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Zai, I don't know how to pronounce that. Z-Y-X-E-P says, would you do another project with a vending machine if you got the opportunity? Um, yeah, I think I would. Uh, I don't, the slot machine part of the slot machine project was fun. Um, the ATM part was not. <laughs> and I, I would be hesitant to do anything with ATM machines in the future. Um, just because it's so regulated and so locked down and there was so much cryptography and like, just craziness, and we had a hard time getting parts. Like it, that, that that part was miserable. Um, it was fun digging into it, but then once I started like really making modifications and breaking stuff, and then we couldn't get parts, uh, that got really stressful. So, um, but yeah, vending machine, totally. Um, I just don't have like a killer idea for a vending machine. Um, lots of lots of fun to be had. Uh, Noisebridge had a couple vending machines. Um, that we filled up with various cool stuff. Uh, the the vending machines that have the screws, like you can put whatever you want in there and you can set the prices to whatever you want. So you can put, you know, Arduinos in there or tools or, you know, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, um, eyewear, you know, they're great for for hacker spaces and the like. Um, and uh, I, have, uh, I have friends who want to put a vending machine in front of their house with all sorts of cool, mm. awesome things in it. So um, totally... Totally would be up for that. Um, yeah, for me, you know, for uh, stuff that I do in videos, it's just a question of like, can I can I think of a killer idea that like I can present in a really succinct way in a title and a thumbnail that people are going to want to click on and watch? Um, so, um, yes, I do know applied science. I've met Ben a couple times at uh, the Hackaday Supercon conference. Ben's awesome. I love applied science. Um, and I was so impressed by his project. So if you if you haven't seen Applied Science, you definitely need to, to go check it out. Um, it's fantastic. The other thing I'll shout out is um, Breaking Taps. Um, if you uh, if you haven't seen that channel, um, he's doing some incredible things as well. Very much in the vein of Ben, but like d different stuff. I mean, it, it, it's stuff that I could see Ben doing, but um, yeah, um, some really cool stuff around micro machining silicon with uh, a fiber laser. Um, very, very cool stuff. So um, totally worth checking out. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, I think that's about going to do it for today. Um, we're coming up on 3 p.m. here. And uh, yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you again um, to Patrick. And to, uh, I'm going to, Thabis? I might have the name wrong here. Uh, what, uh, um, I'm going to type breaking taps in the chat here. Uh, yeah, so thank you to Scaverat. And I think it's Thabis. Might be getting that wrong. I apologize. Thank you to Patrick. Um, Thank you to everybody for watching. Uh, this has been amazing. Come hang out with us in Discord, discord.gg slash strange parts. Uh, and um, yeah, plenty more shenanigans going on there. Um, we do this every week, uh, Saturdays at noon Pacific. And uh, we'd love to have you on to show off your project, uh, whether or not it's completed. It could be even, you haven't even started it yet, but you have some cool parts to show off or a cool thing to show off. I think. Um, the slot machine, the German slot machine is a perfect example of that is a project in the works. They got it working a little bit. Even if they didn't have it working at all, it would have been a cool thing to look at. So um, very wide range of what um, makes sense. Anything that's interesting that you think this crowd would be into um, would be awesome. You can show us your workshop, your workspace, um, whatever. You can show us a cool thing you bought, um, a cool tool. Uh, really kind of anything goes um, as long as you're, you're well behaved so you don't get the stream banned. Um, 
uh, be welcome to have you. And you can be on camera if you want. You can just show the thing you want to want to show, and we'll talk about it. Or you can just send me some pictures, and I'll kind of react to them. Uh, I'll pull them up on the stream and react to them, and you can uh, hang out and chat and watch. So. Um, whatever whatever your jam is. Um, if you'd like to sign up, um, come hang out with us in Discord, but also you can just uh, put your your info into the form here at strangeparts.com slash show and tell. Um, and then lastly, um, if you'd like to support Strange Parts, the best way to do that um, is to sign up to the Patreon. Um, it starts at $5 a month, um, and you get to see rough cuts of videos that I'm busy working on that we're, we're still editing, um, as well as help me choose what um, projects to work on next. Um, and then at the high, higher tiers, um, we have t-shirts and hoodies um, for the first time ever in Strange Parts history. It's the only way to get a t-shirt and a hoodie right now is to join the Patreon, as well as uh, you can get access to um, the CAD files and other digital design files for projects that I make, um, as well as uh, at, the, at the higher tier, um, be credited in a Strange Parts video uh, not like a rolling credits at the end, but but appear in one of the shots. Um, we'll put your name somewhere, sort of like an Easter egg somewhere in the video. So I'm going to do one to a couple of those per video and make them really cool. So um, if you'd like to check that out, uh, patreon.com slash strange parts. Um, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, support there um, is a lot more meaningful than on Twitch. Twitch takes half of what you contribute, uh, which and and uh, so your your um, contribution goes goes twice as far on Patreon. And that really is going towards um, salaries for hiring full. I'm, I'm hiring two people on the team, um, a producer to work with me on um, ramping back up factory tours and a, a shooter and editor to work with me here on um, big projects in the shop. So, um, so uh, really that money goes towards just making more videos for you to watch. So uh, go check that out if, you, if you'd like to support. Um, if not, no worries. Come hang out. Um, I'm going to continue making content like I always have for free um, here and on YouTube um, and now on TikTok and, and Twitter and all the other places. So uh, with that, um, have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next time here on Strange Parts Show and Tell. Take care.